Good afternoon. Welcome to the first webinar of our 2017 Webinar Wednesday series. We're excited to have over 500 registered attendees for today's webinar, which is eligible for one CE credit from the ACI. MD Publishing is focused on giving back to the HTM community. So let's kick off this fourth year of Webinar Wednesday by giving away an ice blanket to the attendee that can tell me where this year's ICE conference will be held in July. Answer now using the question feature on your dashboard. While you're answering, I want to remind everyone that MD Publishing hosts four conferences throughout the year. Two MD Expos, ICE Conference, our Imaging Conference and Expo, and OR Today Live. Our first MD Expo of the year approaches and I want to invite everyone to join us for the Spring MD Expo in Irvine, California. These three days of learning, networking, and the latest advances in technology, products, and services, attendees that are hospital employees, military, or students can attend for free by using the VIP pass that's included in the Webinar Wednesday workbook for today. All right, and the winner of the ice blanket is Mark Harris. Congratulations. The correct answer was Washington, D.C. or Western Virginia. Webinar Wednesday would like to thank our sponsor, Summit Imaging. Summit Imaging is an ultrasound parts and transducer repair company that can quickly address specific technical needs based on a foundation of outstanding rapid customer service. Their philosophy is simple, make their customers heroes. Visit mysummitimaging.com for more information. Our presenter today is Kyle Grizel, Manager of Global Education and Training at Summit Imaging. He manages Summit's program that offers personalized, interactive courses on ultrasound systems to healthcare organizations across the country. Kyle, you may begin whenever you're ready. Thank you very much, Jamie, and uh, thank you everyone for coming in today. Obviously, we're a little bit off topic compared to how you normally see Summit with uh, actually branching out into mammography and talking about detector plate repair. Uh, so it's about time we start changing that introduction. What we're really going to break it down to today is discuss the repair and support of these digital flat panels and how Summit Imaging is bringing new services to the market that are available to you guys even today. But first, let's break down mammography. Uh, it is a process using low energy x-rays to examine the human breast. This is a straight definition. Really, we're getting into digital mammography these days. What are the big benefits? It's non-invasive. It's immediate. We have many applications besides just this mammography going into digital x-ray in the future. We reduce false positives quickly and prevent overdiagnosis, which has become a very big problem in the mammography industry uh, going back to film days. This works by using an x-ray tube. The beam is concentrated and filtered passes through a compression paddle, through the patient, and then captured on a digital detector plate and sent to a host computer. Now, to break down the digital detector plate, the easiest way it's been explained to me in the past is reverse LCD screen. We have a glass composite array that is composed of cells that can pick up the X-ray signal and convert it into a digital signal for the computer to process. These detectors are actually quite heavy, um, built with carbon fiber, and a metal chassis, and you can actually see a bit of the detector assembly on our right-hand side photo. We then have a connector and what's called a Bucky controller that will allow the assembly to move as well as calibrate. Now, it seems fairly simple, but these are actually very temperamental components, and we'll get further into that construction and how it leads into failures in a moment, but really, the core of the system is this DFP panel. The brick, which is the tower the panel connects to, and the computer are very simple microsystem and host style computers that run the system. And we have run into very few problems with them besides electronics or basic computer style problems like a hard drive failing. But these detector plates, on the other hand, are very sophisticated electronic components that are very well built but also very temperamental, things like temperature control, um, shipping, and just simple wear and tear over time can actually have quite an impact on them. But in the long run, we can't you know, 
come in enough how well built these are. Um, they've even taken some impacts from shipping and still survived. So what have we found with the Logic Selenium systems that we're working on today? Well, the operating system software is an open Unix platform, and all tools to maintain the system are built into it. You can even access the panel to do pixel mapping directly on the system without any sort of external service computers. The compatibility is quite flexible. You're able to modify the brick, which is the tower that you can see on the left side, to run with newer or older components based on what is available on the market. And they have this high quality build. They are quite reliable. Um, it really comes down to almost the operating environment that they exist in that leads to the damage. So let's talk about those leading causes of damage. Electronic issues. You know, coming down to sophisticated troubleshootings that our R&D team has here, we've really nailed down that it is fundamental electronic component failures that lead to failures on these digital flat panels. So capacitors, chips, CPUs, and then physical damage. The interior panel is constructed with a combination of glass and it's protected by carbon fiber. But another note to that is temperature control. These have fans that are cooling components constantly and something as simple as dust can cause a temperature overrun on the panel. And once you run over that temperature limit, that glass and uh, silicon carbon uh, combination starts to have problems. So let's talk about the mix of digital flat panel failures to the repair capabilities that we've been able to come up with. Right now, pixel correction is probably the most common repair that everyone knows about. And it's actually capable of being completed in-house with your own engineers. Pixel correction uh, has a little bit of a bad reputation in the market, though, because you can cover up a lot of pixels. There's a certain mixture where once you cover up those pixels, it becomes an unrepairable array. It's no longer useful. You'd almost say it was a bad quadrant than a bad pixel. But we've been able to get into issues like communication with brick, unable to load drivers, and bad image quadrants that are repairable. Before, these might have been deemed unrepairable and simply replaced with a new panel. The only time that we really find these panels to be unrepairable is delamination of that digital flat panel inside the carbon fiber or that glass array getting cracked. This usually happens from impact damage, something like getting dropped, or uh, over temperature or under temperature in the room, something exceeding, I believe it's 30 to 34 degrees Celsius. If we get up in the 40s, it overheats and it'll actually start cooking that glass. So what are some of the image quality issues we've come up with? Well, we have quadrant dropouts, lines in the array, and pixel dropouts. Some pixel dropouts are able to be corrected uh, free of charge using uh, the software that's actually in the panel. But other issues are controlled by the analog board or by the quadrant itself failing. Uh, giving you some photos here to take a look at, but these boards are very complex and involve a lot of components and take some time to troubleshoot and find if the failure is coming truly from the panel or from the components driving the panel. And then we run into a lot of operational issues. Component level failures. Again, simple electronics, capacitors, chips. These things need to be checked and will often fail over their lifespan. That doesn't mean the part, the part itself has actually come up to the end of its lifespan. It's just that component. Communication with brick. If there is a communication problem, it could actually be the connector. Sometimes we have issues with the Bucky chip, which is actually listed uh, lower, but that uh, board controls many aspects of the system. There's two power supplies in the system, a high voltage and a low voltage in the flat panel alone, and they need to be constantly communicating with the computer in order for it to detect the voltage and properly uh, run the system. We've seen issues where those power supplies stop communicating Again, it could be due to heat, failure of some small components, but they are very temperamental. And then lastly, drivers. This sounds like a very simple computer-based problem, but if the panel isn't loading its drivers properly, it's not going to actually run on the tower. So what other types of damage can we come into? Crystallization has to be one of the 
most prevalent issues for unrepairable that we can see. And this is the panel usually dropping pixels or a full quadrant, sometimes known as edge blurring. And the number one cause of this, again, is temperature control. If the panel overheats or actually gets too cold, in the case of uh, you know, this winter in Seattle, we actually had snow for the first time. And if the panel was out in FedEx truck and not warmed up before it was installed, we could then edge blur our panel. Chassis damage, we have seen some of them come in where they may have been dropped, uh, shipped incorrectly, and the chassis is then warped, then cracking that glass panel. Then delamination. There's a plastic layer, it's protective, over the panel, inside the carbon fiber shell. If this delaminates, eventually over time, while we don't see image quality issues immediately, you might have dust buildup. Contaminants get into this panel, start causing image quality issues, pixels dropping out, quadrants, and lead to a panel failing overall. So delamination, you're not going to be reapplying that plastic black over that glass. We consider that unrepairable at that point. Failure to complete system test. Well, this really is the test that you're going to experience the most on site. It's going to fail right on your brick. The tower will fail to complete a system test like a 2D test or a signal to noise ratio. And at this point, we need to go through a full suite of QC tests in order to get to the down panel. Another prominent error that we have not actually run into very much, but we've seen on forums like medwrench.com and on manuals is error 100. This is also in combination with a hot link failure, which is the connection and communication between the brick or the tower and the DFP panel itself. So what kind of QC and testing has someone adopted at this point? We do a nearly four hour QC test with every panel that we repair. It begins with all monitor, uh, monitoring and temperature control of the room itself. We had to set up a very special room in our shop just to keep these panels at a good, safe operating temperature. And then when you install them on the system, they require about a one hour warm up time to kind of acclimate to the room and to the system itself. At that point, we start doing a gain calibration, an EC calibration, EA. an EA calibration, a 2D dark offset calibration, and a signal to noise ratio test. All of these tests include firing the machine multiple times, totaling about an hour for each test. At the end of that, we would have actually put the panel through a stress test, as well as monitored the temperature this whole time while we're running the panel live. Some of the things we're doing to expand the support of mammography in the third party market is technical support and online support. If you guys have gone to mysummitimaging.com, you've seen this already before with our ultrasound products. We're able to create videos about installation and removals, troubleshooting, and we want to do that for mammography as well. We'll create how-to pages, identify common failing components, and share this information with the community so you can troubleshoot on your own. But then our tech support team will be trained to assist with troubleshooting installations in the future. In fact, they're already doing some of it right now. We'll build out pages for parts and detectors for MIMID teams to be able to use as references. So I encourage you guys to keep up with our website, mysummitimaging.com, for these updates. So I keep talking about our wonderful R&D team. What's next for them? Well, we're going to start adopting new manufacturers, including rolling out Siemens support by the end of quarter two of 2017. We're looking into care stream panels. In fact, we've been exploring them recently and had a lot of success with testing and repairs. And they're always looking for new projects and new organizations to partner with to bring new innovations to the repair market for ultrasound, mammography, x-ray, CT. There's nothing our team isn't afraid to tackle because they're a great bunch of guys for some of the smartest people I know. And this hasn't been a problem they've been able to solve here before. What do we do moving forward? Well, as you guys know, Summit Imaging is an ISO 1345-2003 certified facility for ultrasound. We're going to expand our QMS system to include this detector plate repair, and we're going to add this new QMS to our upcoming audit in April. 
So as of April, we'll be continuing to seek that um, ISO audit for all products that we get in the future, but we should be able to add mammography at that time. So in the room with me is Larry Nguyen, our CEO, myself, and James Taylor, one of the leaders in our R&D team. And we want to field your questions and talk more about this mammography and see where we can help you guys in the future. Hey, Kyle, this is Jamie. And we do have uh, a few questions that are coming in. I'm going to get us started with one. How does Summit troubleshoot for these panels? Well, this is Larry Wynn, uh, CEO and CTO of Summit, and you know the, these are the kinds of product expansions that uh, you know Summit is really excited about, and you know this is really the manifestation of us uh, partnering with uh, our great customers in ultrasound, and uh, they they ask us questions like, hey, uh, you do ultrasound so well, uh, could you try this and could you try that, and and you know we're just privileged to be able to pursue these kinds of opportunities with healthcare facilities and you know across the globe. And to kind of tackle the, the question about uh, testing, uh, the, the first thing uh, was we, we had to get these live systems in-house uh, within our facility to be able to not only perform the research it takes to better understand the equipment, but to have the live systems to test. So one of our philosophies at Summit is we must test everything on a target system, uh, and we do not use any simulators. And so specifically for the mammography, uh, we are testing uh, for, for temperature, we're testing image quality, um, you know, we're testing, going through all the calibrations to ensure that when this panel is installed in, in a hospital uh, or a clinic, that the intended result is this panel should look like it came straight from, you know, a replacement uh, detector from the OEM. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these are the things that, you know, it's been tough to gather what that looks like from, you know, uh, what the com uh, compilation of tests are to be as thorough as possible. And that's why these partnerships are so uh, so important because the manuals, while they are wonderful and they have a lot of information, uh, there's a lot of kind of uh, tribal knowledge and, and tips and tricks uh, to, to ensure that the testing is covering uh, you know, the, the smattering of errors and, and failures that we do have uh, within mammography. So what we do have QC checklists. Uh, it is going through our ISO 1345 system to expand here in April. But, you know, the end game really is, you know, getting a phantom on there, uh, firing on a real uh, mammography system, and, and doing it over and over and over again uh, to not only know that there's a one good image, but it's a lot of good images over a duration of time in a controlled environment uh, to be able to pull it back to a healthcare facility. Uh, so yes, uh, image quality is everything to us, uh, no matter what the modality, and we are testing them on live ultrasound systems, uh, abiding by the uh, manual uh, that Whole Logic has built uh, for these, and ensuring that you know the pixels uh, are correct. Uh, there's not too many pixels that are dead in one area, and you're overscaling uh, too many in, in a small um, a sector of the plate and making sure that that's all reflected within our QMS. Yeah. Great. I, I have another audience question that's come in. Do most or all of these DFPs have or require an external temp control unit? No, we're not seeing that there's an external temperature control unit. Uh, there are many thermistors uh, kind of on all the boards that are, are driving um, the actual array itself. Um, we are able to go in and, and link up to them um, with some external PCs that we do here at Summit, uh, leveraging our ability to you know kind of link in or hyperlink into an ultrasound system. We leverage that knowledge and into the mammography and we actually communicate directly with the panel and we can actually monitor the temperatures um, and kind of where the, uh, the person asking that question is, hey, how do you know what the temperatures are? Uh, we do leverage FLIR a, a lot to ensure that the, temp uh, the temperatures of the panels uh, are adequate to begin firing because that's the last thing we want to do is when a panel comes off a FedEx truck, especially during a snowstorm, we got to allow for the proper acclimation time to not prematurely fire on a panel and then causing that, uh, you know, the panels, when it comes to temperature, they can absorb the temperatures, you know, kind of low and high. It's, it's the acceleration or the velocity of change in temperature that causes the failure and the crystallization on these glass panels. Uh, so we are very careful. Uh, we leverage FLIR technology 
uh, to uh, best understand uh, when is the DFP itself ready uh, to, to be fired on a, on a machine and not cause any damage. So we do use FLIRs as an external um, uh, temperature monitoring device, um, and that is a part of our process. Yeah. But at the root of the question, there's nothing externally uh, on the panel itself, only trusting the internal sensors. Correct. Right. Um, yeah, and at times those internal uh, thermistors are wrong, and those need to be repaired. With the circuits that those are sitting on are failing, and uh, you know we are able to attack those down to a component level. Great. I've had quite a few questions come in that are addressing turnaround time for your facility in various different ways, but here's one specifically that I want to pose to the panel. What is the turnaround time as far as downtime? Usually with a bad detector, we would replace and the site would be down two, maybe three days. This seems like we would need to send the detector back and downtime may be an issue. Yeah, there's a couple of ways we can attack that. Um, you know, we, we work very closely with our customers and, uh, you know, we know downtime is everything. With our typical detector plate turnaround time, um, we're typically looking at about 48 hours um, here. Uh, there are many plates where we can repair um, same day, uh, but that just really depends on the sample uh, or in the failures of those uh, detector plates coming into Summit. And we do have inventory of the plates as well uh, to, to actually ship out and, and do a replacement uh, at a very reasonable cost relative to you know, an, an OEM replacement. And you know, it's, it's this downtime that is something that we, we always reach out to our customers and say, how can we work together? We've had some customers say, hey, uh, Summit, uh, can we just buy an extra panel from you and have one sitting in our clinical engineering shop? And when a panel goes down, we simply take that panel out of the box, we install it, and then you actually uh, you know, receive our repair, and we can repair that, and that replaces the extra stock that's sitting in their clinical engineering department. Um, yeah, so and that gives time for acclimation of the detector plate as well. Um, you know, it, so that's uh, you know we're typically looking about 48 hours, um, give or take, uh, depending on the failures. It could be longer, it could be shorter, but um, you know with the, the level of testing and the repairs that we're able to do here to capture those those failures, um, we're we're confident that you know, we can do them fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. Great. Another attendee would like to know, are you guys fixing at the component level? Component level is where we live. Um, if it's not component level repair, then we're not really interested. Uh, that's really uh, the hallmarks of some imaging is really um, yeah, component level repair. That's where we started. Uh, we started with ultrasound component level repair on, uh, on computers at first, and we expanded our customers. We're saying, hey, uh, these computers are, are very difficult to repair. Can you do the power supply and the monitor and all these things? So when you actually put a product in front of us, and we, we specialize in, in medical imaging devices, it, it's all the same to us. It's just fiberglass as a PCB. It's just components. They're FETs. They're op amps. They're ICs. They're GPUs. They're CPUs. To us, it's all the same. Um, our, our technique and our approach to the repair process is we're trying to identify um, an anomaly. An anomaly may be an open or a short. And we have the techniques and the, the methods and the state-of-the-art equipment and the talented team here to pragmatically go through a troubleshooting process to identify what the failing components are. Um, and as we all know, uh, when you actually throw multiple failures on it, the, the troubleshooting becomes exponentially more difficult because you're not sure if you're, you're chasing a, you know, a bad test point uh, from one failure or if there's actually uh, several circuits rolling into one test point and are we chasing a short that's to the ground plane or whatever have you. But yes, uh, component level repair is, is exactly what Summit Imaging does and I think that's the value that we see we can bring to the healthcare uh, community is that if we're not doing that and we're simply just kind of correcting pixels, there's really no value Summit can give to you. But um, if the, the failure is beyond that and it's like, hey, uh, if there's these GPOs or these EPROMs or whatever have you that are failing, God, that's really hard for a healthcare facility to troubleshoot down that level and take the time or have the state-of-the-art equipment that you need uh, to assess if these things are correct or not. And for us, um, that, that really is uh, our biggest strength. 
I have a couple of questions that are addressing different uh, manufacturers and modalities, asking that if you provide support on these. So ahead of time, I'm going to apologize as I butcher this OEM, but are you, are you doing uh, any repairs or support on older Selenia products at this time? We are really kind of putting a, uh, a line in the sand that we we like to kind of focus on the, the digital side. And so, you know, when it kind of comes to Selenia, if it's a digital system that has a digital receptor plate, uh, that's that's what we're going to focus on. So, you know, as the market moves away from film, um, you know, I think our, our interest is really in the technology that these, you know, all these manufacturers, whether it's any imaging modality, whether it's cath lab, ultrasound, mammography, uh, whatever have you, um, I think that's where we're seeing a need in the marketplace is to provide that level of support. Um, if there's some compatible parts in the gantry or the computers uh, to kind of roll back to film, we, we are more than happy to help. Um, but uh, you know, our focus is really looking forward on the future of imaging, especially in the X-ray market. And it's uh, you know we see that where we can provide the most help to hospitals is through focusing on these digital digital detector plates. I have another question asking uh, if you only do hologic support. Or is there any support on GE Essentials? No GE yet. Um, we, we are getting a, uh, we are always open uh, to partnering with uh, healthcare facilities if they do have the equipment. Uh, it it kind of it rolls out like this, is that our customers come to us and say, hey, we know that uh, you are very competent at what you do, kind of at the crux of electronic repair and software development. We have a need. And, uh, the need is an alternative source to support the equipment to lower the total cost of ownership. And for the near term, uh, we're already working uh, with other healthcare facilities to deploy support for the Siemens mammography system. Uh, the reason why we chose that was because, number one, the customer asked us to. And number two, um, it leverages the same exact technology as the Selenium machine. So it should be a very quick and natural transition. It's just the gantry and the computer might look a little bit different. Uh, however, the value of that equipment really sits on that detector plate. Uh, so from after, after we kind of hit the, the Siemens, um, you know, if everybody on, on a webinar wants to you know, engage with Summit, uh, we are open uh, to absolute uh, suggestions and the possibility to partner and say, hey, we do have a lot of these GE MAMO systems and we need you to support them or any other types of um, OEMs that are developing uh, mammography equipment. Those are the kinds of co conversations that we're inviting in the summit right now to identify you know, where we need to grow as an organization, but that growth really has to follow the need of healthcare facilities. Right, and forgive me if this one's circling back, but uh, we have it recorded asking, are you doing repairs on newer dimension detectors? So yes, that is in the plans. Uh, we don't have a deadline set on that, but we are uh, very focused on being able to roll out those repair capabilities by the end of 2017. I know uh, it's hard to think kind of two, three, four quarters ahead, but uh, as we master uh, the Selenia systems and the, and the Siemens systems, uh, we've had a lot of requests uh, to, to work on the new dimensions. And uh, we are hoping that the, the transition in technology that we're going to find there is going to be very similar to that of ultrasound probes with the matrix. Uh, you know, we kind of went from the 2D and the linear and all that to the matrix transducer arrays where they're just the sophistication and, and the multiplexing that's involved. Um, it, it, we are assuming it's going to be very similar. So if it is is very similar, then we can apply the same techniques that we're doing on matrix TEEs, matrix sector probes and whatnot. Those repair techniques and the philosophy of electronics and the way that data flows uh, between the panels and, and the uh, host computers themselves should be pretty similar. Uh, so I think that is another project to you know kind of peel that onion back and understand what are the failures that our customers are having, what are the common failures, what are the kind of the rare failures that are more extraordinary, and then really focusing on the common ones uh, to bring those to market at first. Mm -hmm. Here's a great question. What is your go-to tool in identifying the problem at the component level? Our people. 
I, I know it's a really cliche answer, but you know we do have state-of-the-art technology. We use industrial X-ray, so we're using industrial X-ray to troubleshoot X-ray equipment. Believe it or not, <laughs> um, the DMM is our favorite tool. Uh, nothing, nothing beats an old-school DMM and mm -hmm. and uh, and a really talented tech on knowing what to look for. Um, you know, using gold standards uh, for test points. Um, you know, and but. Yeah, and, and you, leveraging our software, I mean, uh, James is kind of piping up here, he's like, uh, another tool that we use is our software development capabilities is, you know, we're building our own, you know, diagnostic tools along the way to read directly into the, you know, you know the, the brick or the digital flat panel to understand kind of the, the serial information that tra uh, is uh, translated to our, our Windows PCs when we're looking at it through HyperTerminal. Uh, that, Gives us so much more information than what's kind of transposed uh, into a a more rudimentary language through uh, onboard diagnostics, and so kind of the smattering of tools that we have is you know software development and diagnostics, DMM, you know, industrial X-ray, um, and all those kinds of things are fantastic, but it needs a talented technician, a master technician behind these tools to really understand what these can provide to us. Do most states require a physicist reinspection after repair or replacement for detectors? Most states and most hospitals include a physicist reevaluation after the installation. I have actually heard of no one um, not mentioning that they have to have their physicist back in. It also seems to be a bit of a pain point. Um, that's why this turnaround time is incredibly essential because not only does the panel have to be back into the system usually within 24, 48 hours, but then after it's installed and tested by a technician, then you can schedule an appointment with a physicist to recertify the machine. Hopefully, most people have physicists on site or within their health network to get this done quickly, but if not, that can turn into the lengthy process after the replacement. All right, next question. Is temperature maintained internally by external chillers or internally with a filter type thermoelect device? Uh, it's, 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 it's maintained internally by, by the fans uh, uh, that are, are on the device. Yeah. There's, there's four fans on these detector plates, and we, we found uh, when they're deinstalled that uh, the fan's effectiveness uh, it is directly correlated with how much dust is accumulated on them. So we do recommend, you know, kind of during PM procedures that just simply blow out the, the fans because when those start to, you know, reduce their RPMs over time or, you know, the reduced CFM airflow uh, of the fans, it really impacts the temperature, uh, not only of the plate, but it starts taxing the electronic components, you know, and especially those thermistors. You know, if those start to go bad, um, you know, because of the fluctuations uh, in higher heat, essentially, because mm -hmm. if you if you kind of boil everything down, uh, what kills electronics? It's heat, and if we can kind of control that heat better, um, that with those fans, uh, that just will make those plates last a lot longer. So, kind of with these external chillers and all these types of equipment, um, the, the the thing that really impacts the the duration of service of these detector plates are those four fans that are mm -hmm. on the chassis itself. To expand upon it even further, um, Hologic includes right in some of the first pages of their manuals, and, and you can see this posted almost anywhere online, leave the system running. It actually will monitor and cool, cool itself, say, over a weekend or over the evening while it's not in use. Those are the times when it, you say your AC system shuts off, it's during the summertime, or it's too active and it cools it off during that overnight period or the weekend, and they try to fire the machine up first thing, and it's not acclimated anymore. That's what causes that heat damage. This is going back to different types of repairs that you can provide. Are you repairing the detectors for 3D LORADs? No, not as the moment, but we would love to have the conversation if somebody is interested out there to pursue those. This one is a longer question. Will you be supporting only the detectors or also the brick controllers? Also, since all of these detectors are at different firmware as well as bricks, will you support the different firmware levels and needed upgrade downgrades to match the systems? 
We found that the compatibility is quite wide. Uh, so to be able to install um, one panel from one gantry to another um, has been a very small issue. Uh, you know, opening this R&D project, we thought that that would be a, a large issue. Um, however, we're finding that all the panels are, are really compatible, uh, depending, you know, regardless of the firmware uh, that's kind of running on the machines. And we're seeing that these drivers not being able to install whatever have you, um, that we've, we're actually finding component level failures when it comes to it. So when it's trying to load um, a driver, you know, it could be, you know, a, you know the circuit to the memory or, or the memory chip itself that could be an issue. And those are things that we're attacking. And um, as to answer the question on the rest of the support of the, of the system, yes, we do. Uh, we kind of see that as um, you know, a bolt-on to the detector plate because the, the parts that are in the gantry uh, very rudimentary relative to the sophistication of the detector plate itself. Um, you know, even compared to ultrasound electronics, um, I think the, the PCB uh, design and the sophistication of, of all the boards and the power supplies in the gantry and the computer itself, um, you know, we're, we're probably talking 10, 15 year old technology that's driving a state of the art detector plate. Uh, so very simple for us to um, you know, to repair as well. We do have a small inventory as of the moment uh, to support those. We're seeing some motors go out. Uh, so yes, we do have full support uh, for the Selenia system. However, so far um, with the sample size that we've been working with, uh, we're seeing the detector plates are the issue. Uh, you know, nine times out of ten. Okay, guys, I think this question is circling back to the question about the external chillers and the fans, but an attendee would like you to expand on smart fans. Would you mind repeating that question? A smart fan? The question only says smart fans. I was thinking it circled back to the question on controlling the temperature either internally or externally. I think maybe the question's more about, like, in, in newer computer systems, there's temperature controllers on the fans themselves, um, and I'm are those... Saying, I'm not saying that on these fans. Yeah. Um, it looks like the temperature is being monitored by the onboard computer, mm -hmm. and it's driving the fans. So okay. they are not really smart fans. They, they are just uh, being driven by the computer on board. Yeah, so I, I think um, to... I hope we're interpreting the question correctly, um, but uh, the, the only thing that's really controlling the temperature of the plate itself uh, really are the four fans, and uh, that's being monitored in a couple of different ways. Um, the components uh, on the actual board itself uh, have thermistors, and you know if those thermistors aren't reading this correctly, then the host computer that is communicating with the with the digital detector plate um, with those thermistors. If that's wrong going to the computer, then the computer is going to overdrive or underdrive the fans, depending on which way that the uh, thermistor wants to, you know, inaccurately read uh, the internal temperature. And so when we're kind of talking about kind of external, I'm hearing uh, another way to interpret the question is how do I control the temperature of this detector plate to make it last longer? And that really is kind of coming back to Kyle. Uh, Kyle's answer, which was, you really got to keep your machines on and ensure that the environment, the ambient temperature of your room is consistent. And the more consistent the ambient temperature is in your lab, um, the, the less taxing it's going to be on those fans inside the detector plate. And the less taxing those fans are, the, the easier it is for that system to maintain a stable temperature. This attendee is representing an all-digital imaging department. They would like to know, will you be doing repairs on detectors for RAD, CAS Lab, and IR systems? Yes. Uh, you know, this is where the invitation uh, is. Uh, we would love to work on those. We just, uh, we're at a point where we're ready uh, to expand our repair capabilities and, and re expand our, our product um, offerings uh, to the healthcare community. And if there's an opportunity for us to work with you, yes. Um, you know, we are currently working on some projects in Cath Lab, and uh, you know, we're we're actually building uh, onboard diagnostic software uh, for some Cath Labs out there because we've been hearing from our customers saying it is very difficult for us to even install a part or to do a calibration or whatever uh, needs to be done to get this, these machines back up to full functionality. So, you know, we, we are working on cath lab equipment on the software side, 
um, when it comes to the detector plate repairs. Um, that's a different conversation that must occur because we have to work with the uh, partner and saying, well, if we need to do some research, then we need a panel. Um, you know, so is there, is there a panel that's an opportunity to get a trade-in panel from the healthcare facility to start working on it? That might become an inventory piece for the clinical engineering um, that, that as, if we do fix it. Um, but, you know, kind of at that point is the other uh, hurdle that we face is we need a live system to be able to test on. And sometimes, uh, you know, we, we just don't have that. And we've been commissioned by some customers and saying, hey, actually, take a stab at it with your DMM and, and your industrial x-ray and, and your talented team to try and troubleshoot this and then fly down to our facility and we can test this together to validate that everything works. So there's a lot of ways to skin a cat in this particular situation and as we start walking into this very high level uh, and high value equipment, um, these are where these partnerships are really crucial for us to develop the knowledge to see if these are even repairable. Uh, we believe it is because it's just all computers and electronics and that's what we specialize in. It's just the access to, to validate if this is actually a, uh, a repairable model or not. And you know, with the mammography detector plates, you know, we quickly learned that we, we can't fix delamination. We can't fix the crystallization between the array and the glass. Uh, we can't do that. But everything else, you know, there, there's a really good chance that we're able to resolve those issues. All right, as of now, I have two questions left for the Q&A, but attendees, we still have at least 15 minutes scheduled, so if you have a question you'd like to pose to any of the Summit Imaging guys, please go ahead and uh, do so now using the questions feature on your dashboard. But the next question is, Traxel and Canon are common digital detectors used on general x-ray systems. Do you have plans to repair these detectors? It's not in our scope for the next three, four, five, six months. Uh, definitely can be in our scope. Um, we're focusing on care stream panels right now. Um, our experience with the care stream, I'm thinking is going to leverage directly into these other general radiology type of detector plates. And what we found on those is, you know, they're, they're kind of portable. Um, they use a, an auxiliary battery to power up um, and you know, kind of an extraordinary circumstance that uh, we were repairing is that these panels just weren't powering up. We had success on actually reworking um, the, the circuitry inside of these panels to resurrect them from you know, something that would be a defective core that would just be you know, thrown in the garbage to something that, wow, it works again and it images great. And then another care stream panel that we were working on um, was actually uh, had fluid intrusion and we had no idea that that would happen. Uh, you know, we, we see fluid intrusion on TE probes all the time and that's something that we, we deal with, uh, you know, very well on a component level to properly clean everything out, uh, restore all the circuits to where there's no more noise. And we actually leveraged that technology and those methods and techniques in ultrasound to bring over to now a fluid intrusion uh, case within general x-ray panels. And so that care stream, we had to completely disassemble it. Uh, what happened was it was actually underneath a waterbed uh, with a patient when they went onto the waterbed, it, uh, the waterbed actually got punctured. And then all the water just drenched all over the panel. And you know, it, it, when it came in, we're like, wow, uh, we see fluid intrusion, how'd that happen? So we, we're learning with our customers. They're telling us exactly the scenario on why this occurs. We opened it up. We cleaned up all the electronics. Uh, the, the particular failure uh, was was several, right? It, it, uh, there were some high voltage shorts uh, between many circuits, and the issue was that it wasn't powering on because there were shorts. And then from there, we had to battle some image quality issues. So we actually had to attack the flex circuit on the perimeter of the entire panel uh, to restore all those circuits because now with the, the fluid in there, you're getting some shorts between you know, the, the distance between these flex circuits is, you know, less than a millimeter. They're very small, so even a drop of water in there, you are shorting three or four elements together, and that's going to cause you image quality problems. So these are the things that, you know, we are trying to continue to learn and, and to, you know, leverage the technology that we've built here at Summit so far to offer these new product offerings to, to healthcare facilities. So, you know, the imitation is absolute when you say please reach out to one of us and let's talk about you know these alternative solutions that we may be able to build and then we can help you but also help others within the healthcare community as well. 
Can summit imaging help with pixel mapping? Absolutely. Yes. Uh, please give us a call. We have tech supports 24-7, and we can absolutely walk you through uh, pixel mapping. It's extraordinarily easy, and uh, you'll be surprised on how easy it is. And if you can do it in-house, there's a lot of power to that because it reduces your downtime and uh, you know, keeps everybody happy, uh, keeps the mammal machines working, and ultimately lowering your total cost of ownership. All right, guys, what's next for the Summit R&D team? There's a lot. Uh, you know, the the R&D team is, is an extraordinary team that we have here, and we're so proud to have them. Uh, as we roll forward, there's, there's two things that we want to leverage uh, that we've built uh, a great deal of expertise and experience in, and that's software development and hardware uh, component level repair. So we're just trying to identify what are the uh, pain points that hospitals have in the community where they feel like they just don't have a good alternative um, uh, to some more costly options. And that's where we want to intervene and just have the conversation and possibly launch a project to say, this is something that we can offer to you that would you know, save a lot of money and drive your cost down, but it's just not available globally because there's no other option. We just are asking to be able to be a part of the conversation to see if it's even an option. And we think there's a lot of power uh, to combining that hardware component level repair with software development into one package because often uh, that we found is that's kind of the, the 360 degree view that you need to be able to support this in the hospital environment. So imagine a clinical engineer, wow, I can replace this part all day long, but the software won't allow me to do it. Well, Summit can help and say, well, there's, these are two projects. You know, can we repair the hardware you're trying to install? But in addition to that, that's not where the, that's not where the project ends. Is there an opportunity to actually develop a software? And we've named it Adepto. Can we build a version of Adepto to be able to install that part? And so that's kind of what we we're doing on the cath lab side, which was, you know, I need to install this part, but I get an anticipated hardware configuration error every single time I do something, so I'm forced to call an outside service because they have the tools to do it. Well, we we're actually able to build those tools ourselves and give them to you to use. And it's completely, um, you know, FDA compliant, and, and we've gone through all the, the rigorous tests uh, to make sure that, you know, we are operating in a way that is, you know, ISO compliant and, and really empowers the engineers to do all the service on their own. That sounds great. And thanks, Larry, Kyle, James, for your time today. And of course, thanks to the sponsor, Summit Imaging. One of our lucky attendees will win an Amazon gift card for completing the post-webinar survey, which will appear on your screen shortly. You must complete the survey to obtain your certificate of attendance. If you do not see the survey, you may email us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. Be sure to check our calendar for the next upcoming webinars. It's at one, the number one, technation.com forward slash webinars. Enjoy the rest of your afternoons.